May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Please join me in our call to worship. What shall we return to the Lord for all the good things God has done for us? We will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who find their refuge in God. And now let us confess our sins before God, first silently, and then by joining together in our unison prayer of confession.
Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our scripture lesson this evening comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 13. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during the supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and then to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash each other's feet. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. In an upstairs room, a parable is about to come alive. And while they bicker about who's best, with a painful glance, he'll silently rise. Their Savior servant must show them how, through the will of the water and the tenderness of the towel. These are the opening lyrics in Michael Card's song, The Basin and the Towel, and the scripture reading this evening was his inspiration for writing the words. In the scene, Jesus is in the upper room with his 12 disciples and knows that his death is imminent. He knows his life is in danger, and the disciples know that their lives are in danger as well. They're alienated from their families and friends and from society at large, hanging on to each other for support, friendship, encouragement. They're frightened. They're hungry. They're self-focused. They're bickering when they enter the room for their last meal together. Who's the greatest among them, they're asking. What will happen when Jesus goes away as he tells them he's going to do? Who will be next in line? Who will hold the most power? Who will sit beside him when he ascends into heaven? That's their focus, as they find their seats at the table. But Jesus is focused on something else entirely, his final message to his disciples, both in word and in action. He knows his death is imminent. 
and that one of his disciples is about to betray him. Yet the Gospel tells us that having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them till the end. Despite their doubts, despite Judas' betrayal, despite Peter's denial, despite their desertion at the foot of the cross, Jesus loves them till the end. It's an unforgettable scene that night in the upper room, the shadows, the stillness, the hushed voice of Jesus speaking very carefully, very intently, because he wanted to get it all said while there was still time and to get it right. That's when he gets up from the chair and removes his robe and ties a towel around his waist and pours water into a basin and begins to wash the disciples' feet. We who have modern conveniences miss the significance of what he did, washing the clay-caked feet of the disciples. In Jesus' day, it was the most intimate of acts when a wife might do for her husband. But the task was also considered so menial, so objectionable, that not even a slave could be required to wash his master's feet. And yet Jesus bends down anyway, slowly and tenderly washes the feet of the disciples, shocking them, touching them to the core of their very being. Max Lucado puts it this way, one grimy foot after another, Jesus works his way down the row. Hands that shape the stars now wash away the filth. Fingers that form mountains now massage the feet. And the one before whom all nations will one day kneel, now kneels before his disciples. Hours before his own death, Jesus' concern is singular. He wants his disciples to know what love looks like. You can be sure Jesus knows the future of all of their feet. Those feet that will dash for cover at the flash of a Roman sword. One pair of feet who will abandon him that very night at the table. Jesus knows what these men are about to do. By morning they'll bury their heads in shame and look down at their feet in disgust. And when they do, he wants them to remember how his knees knelt before them and he washed their feet. He wants them to remember how he forgave their sins even before they committed them and how he offered mercy before they asked for it. This is an example of love, he says. This is what it means to be a friend. So do this for one another. Be vulnerable. Be humble. Serve each other. Show each other what it means to put the other first. Jesus' love is costly, assertive, total, unconditional. It's about doing nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regarding others as better than yourself. It's about looking not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. And it's about letting the same mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, becoming human like us. Michael Card ends his songs with these words. This parable can live again when one will kneel and one will yield. Our Savior's servant has shown us how, through the will of the water and the tenderness of the towel. Love came to us in human form, humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And that's what love looks like. That's what Jesus did for us, lived for us, died for us, so that our lives would be spared. 
It's for love that Jesus gathers his disciples and goes into the night, into the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's for love that Jesus is willing to be arrested, convicted, and crucified. The outstretched arms of the cross are not just a symbol of suffering. They're also an offer of eternal promise. God's love embraces us in the outstretched arms of Jesus Christ so that we never have to worry about how much we are loved again. No, nothing in life or in death can ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not then, not now, not ever. Thanks be to God. The invitation to the Lord's Supper is offered to everyone who has been baptized. All that's required is a penitent heart and a willing spirit. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now hear the words of institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ as they were delivered to us by the Apostle Paul. He writes, I have received of the Lord that which I have also given to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had broken it, he said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, Jesus took the cup when he had supped and gave it to his disciples and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. And so as our Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took the elements, so may we take these elements and the elements at home and set them apart from their common use to this holy use and mystery. And as he gave thanks and blessed them, let us now draw near to God in prayer and thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to deliver us from the bondage of sin and death. In humility he came to us and knelt in obedience to love's commands. And in freedom he's now taken our place in death, so that we might have eternal life with him in his kingdom. In the deserts of our wanderings he sustains us, giving us his body as manna for our weariness. And the cup of suffering he drank has become for us the cup of salvation. In his death he ransomed us from death's dominion, and in his resurrection he opened the way to eternal life. And so remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this cup from the gifts you've given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. And we humbly ask you, O merciful God, to keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory and we feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God, world without end. 
And now as our Savior taught us to pray, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us share these gifts together at Christ's table. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The bread we take and the cup that we share, is it not sharing in the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And so we are. Let us join together in our unison prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious God, we thank you that you have nurtured us at the table of your Son, Jesus Christ. You have placed your life into our hands. Now we place our lives into yours. Take us, renew and remake us, and dismiss us in peace. For our eyes have now seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people. May we be your living presence in this world and in the world to come. Amen. Betrayal. Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, Very truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. 
Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, Do quickly what, are you, what you are going to do. After receiving the piece of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. The shadow of desertion. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. The shadow of the arrest. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him.
a shadow of denial. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. But Peter was following at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him and said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else on seeing him said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then about an hour later, still another kept insisting, Surely this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. At that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. the shadow of rejection. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate wished to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. the shadow of the cross. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to be crucified. The Shadow of Death. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last.
Thank <laughs> you.